Well, the time is now at noon, so we will get going for today's Lunch and Learn. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Uh, just a quick thumbs up from you, Michelle, if you can hear me okay. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. Uh, welcome to Saving the Winged Maple Leaf Mussel from Extinction. My name is Jen Lutz, and I am the Operations Manager for Wild Rivers Conservancy of the St. Croix and Namakagan. And I'm Bethany Cox, the Director of Development for Wild Rivers Conservancy. The Conservancy is the official nonprofit partner of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway, a unit of the National Park Service. The Conservancy inspires stewardship to forever ensure the rare ecological integrity of the St. Croix and Namakagan Riverway. As a nonprofit, we depend on the support of individuals and businesses throughout the watershed to carry out our important mission. Excuse me. If you are inspired by our work today, please consider becoming a member, volunteering, or participating in one of our many upcoming events. And for those of you who are already supporters, thank you. Before we begin, we would like to take a few moments to talk about housekeeping. To ensure the best video quality, please keep your camera off and remain on mute. Today's Lunch and Learn has some pre-recorded segments. While you can type questions at any time in the chat, Michelle will be available at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. This program will also be recorded and a link will be sent out to you in the next few days. The recording will also be available to view on the Conservancy's YouTube channel. Today's Lunch and Learn is going to cover important, innovative work that is being done here in the watershed to save one of the endangered mussel species found in the St. Croix from extinction, the winged maple leaf mussel. Our presenter today is Michelle Barch. Michelle is a research biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey Upper Midwest Environmental Sciences Center located in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Over the past 25 years, her research has more broadly focused on the effects of water quality and nutrient dynamics on riverine food webs, the conservation and restoration of endangered freshwater mussels, and the effects of invasive species control on riverine ecosystems. Her more recent field and laboratory studies on freshwater mussels include host fish identification, investigating the movement pattern of host fish within natural systems, and the identification of species-specific factors that influence propagation success, all of which you'll be learning a little bit more about today. As a reminder, some parts of this presentation have been pre-recorded. Questions may be asked in the chat window to be answered by Michelle at the end of the presentation. I'd like to thank everybody for joining in on this lunch and learning series, and hopefully uh, by the end of this you'll I'll learn a bit more about winged maple leaf and the importance uh, of this particular species to the St. Croix River, uh, as well as get pretty excited and pumped up about uh, how difficult these animals are to actually culture and uh, some of the struggles that we're having, um, trying to see to it that we can keep these animals around for long periods of time. I'm a research biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, the Upper Midwest Environmental Sciences Center. And I'll be presenting some of this ongoing collaborative research on the propagation of the federally endangered winged maple leaf in the St. Croix River. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to provide you some introductory slides on the USGS and our UMass facility. USGS is a resource for all aquatic and terrestrial programs across the country with more than 300 office locations, which includes 16 ecosystem science centers and 40 cooperative research units. The mission of USGS is to serve the nation by providing reliable scientific information to describe and understand the earth, minimize the loss of life and property from natural disasters, manage water, biological, energy, and mineral resources, and enhance and protect the quality of life. The USGS has five mission areas within seven regions shown here on the map. The mission areas are listed here to the left, including the ecosystems, energy and minerals, natural hazards, water, and core science system mission areas. The USGS Ecosystems Mission Area is the biological research arm of the Department of Interior, and it provides science to help Americans achieve sustainable management and conservation of its biological resources. The research that we're going to talk about today falls within this ecosystems mission area. UMISC is a 65 acre campus located in La Crosse, Wisconsin. 
It is a state-of-the-art 100,000 square foot research facility with 120 employees on site. And here you can see an aerial overview of that campus. Our aquatic science capacity includes 50 earthen ponds of various sizes and includes concrete raceways. We have a full-time fish culturist on staff and support staff who help to care for and provide high quality fish for research purposes. This outdoor pond facility is proving to be a really important aspect of our wing maple leaf propagation efforts. As I mentioned, this is a highly collaborative study on the wing maple leaf propagation, which is being conducted by numerous partners. And those include those shown here from the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, McAllister College, the University of Minnesota, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, both the Minnesota and Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the National Park Service, and the Wild Rivers Conservancy. You may notice that I changed the title slide here a bit um, to state that we're trying to help save an endangered mussel species. Um, as you may see from the rest of this presentation that we're really just in the infancy of trying to have success to try to propagate this species. So with that, I'll go ahead and go through uh, what we've learned so far. The wing maple leaf is a federally endangered species that was listed in 1991, and a recovery plan was developed for this species in 1997. One of the tasks within the recovery plan is to assist with reestablishing the St. Croix River strain of the wing maple leaf within its historic range. This species historically occurred in at least 41 rivers across 16 Midwestern states. Since being listed in 1991, four additional populations have been confirmed in the southern reaches of the Mississippi River drainage basin. However, the St. Croix River contains the only known self-sustaining population in the upper Mississippi River basin, and this population is genetically distinct from the southern populations. This diagram represents the life cycle of the winged maple leaf. Within the St. Croix River, the channel catfish shown here is the only known host for the winged maple leaf. However, both the channel catfish and the blue catfish have been shown to be suitable reproductive hosts. Wing maple leaf have a unique brooding period in that the females are only gravid for a brief period in the fall, typically beginning in late August to the first part of October. The glochidia overwinter on their host fish and complete their development in the spring, at which point they drop off the host fish. Research has shown that the requirement for the host fish to carry the wing maple leaf glochidia for approximately six months over winter has been a challenge due to high fish mortality. And in addition, rearing the newly released juveniles has been a major period of mortality and juvenile loss. Propagation efforts for the wing maple leaf have been ongoing really since 2004 after that identification of the host fish being the blue and channel catfish. And since that time, really only one cohort or batch of juvenile wing maple leaf has been successfully propagated and released into the river. Um, those fish were, the channel catfish were inoculated with glochidia from um, the wing maple leaf in the St. Croix. They were held then over winter at the Genoa National Fish Hatchery. And then prior to the juveniles releasing from their host fish, they moved the fish into cages that were placed into the St. Croix River uh, and then came back in the fall to try to recover any juveniles that may have dropped off those host fish early in the spring. And unfortunately did not recover um, any juvenile mussels. However, nine years later in 2014, during an unrelated dive search, divers actually found uh, approximately 600 adult wing maple leaf in a concentrated area. And they believe that those mussels were actually from a propagation effort from 2004. So we know that it's definitely possible to successfully propagate wing maple leaf. It's just been really difficult. And um, so the objectives of this current study are to uh, compile all of the historic data over the last 17 years of propagation efforts on this species into a searchable database to hopefully identify potential knowledge gaps that may be limiting propagation success. And then we plan to use this information to direct alternative field and laboratory propagation techniques to hopefully optimize the production of juvenile wing maple leaf. And then lastly, uh, we plan to characterize the movement pattern of wild caught channel catfish from the St. Croix River that we artificially inoculate with the wing maple leaf glochidia, implant 
those fish with a transmitter, release them into the river, and then identify where those fish move and potential uh, future locations for juvenile uh, release sites. Uh, so areas that the fish were when the juveniles would have been dropping off. So we can hopefully go back and search those areas for um, surviving uh, adult wing maple leaf. So I'm just going to walk you through a, the next series of slides talking about the wing maple leaf propagation process. Uh, and that really begins with having healthy host fish. Uh, in mid-August of 2020, we received hatchery rear channel catfish from the Blind Point Fish Hatchery located in Sweet Springs, Missouri. This is a great opportunity for us to get larger size channel catfish, 18 to 24 inches, and be able to inoculate them with the wing maple leaf from the St. Croix, the larvae. Uh, and then the, the whole idea here was to try to hold them over winter under more natural conditions in our pond facility um, at UMass, thinking that these larger size fish may be able to withstand uh, these longer holding periods with the parasitic larvae attached to them. So uh, we were. Uh, able to, to get those fish, and then we did take a subsample of them and sent them to the Lacrosse Fish Health Laboratory for disease free certification, uh, where the fish were that subsample was tested for known fish pathogens and viruses. 30 days later, we got the results back stating that the fish were free from those um, tested pathogens and viruses. So, in the end of August, uh, members from the muscle coordination team, which includes members from federal, state, and non governmental agencies began dive searches along the aggregation lines that were established uh, for the winged maple leaf uh, in the St. Croix. And with the assistance of our partners uh, in September, we were able to inoculate two batches of these larger size channel catfish with the winged maple leaf larvae. And here you see below uh, pictures of Megan Bradley going through that process of uh, inoculating the fish with the wing maple leaf glochidia. The upper right here shows uh, a gravid female displaying. Um, that female is collected, brought back in a, a bag of river water held in the cooler uh, to our facility. And then Megan um, takes a small sample of those uh, glochidia from the wing maple leaf, places them into a petri dish and under a microscope, um, tests, looks for um, the viability of those larvae by placing a small amount of salt crystals uh, into uh, the peach onto the petri dish, and if those little larvae, which are often are are open completely, their valves are open when they are exposed to the salt solution, as they would be uh, when they are attached to a fish. That salt um, stimulates them to snap shut similar to what they would do snapping shut onto the gills of a fish in this case. After the viability is tested, if it's um, greater, 90, greater than 90%, we then place the slurry of that solution into a large tank with a small amount of uh, vigorously aerated water. Our host fish are in there and we time their exposure, which would be about 10 minutes. And then after that time, we would take one of the fish out, look at them under, uh, a lighted um, air, a lighted assistance to be able to see the, the gills of the fish to determine the level of infestation. What you don't want to see is a large number of really, really tiny glochidia attached to the gills of the fish. Um, if that happens, there's the potential that you could kill your host fish. So we're looking for a, a, a low to moderate infestation level. And that can be somewhat difficult to see because the glochidia of the wing maple leaf are somewhere between 50 to 60 microns in size. So certainly very difficult to see um, the number of glochidia that are attached when they're we're going on so small. Once the channel catfish are inoculated with the wing maple leaf glochidia, we transfer them to our outdoor earthen ponds and we hold them at natural temperatures over winter. During this time, we're carefully monitoring the water temperature of the ponds, as well as dissolved oxygen concentration. It's important for us to monitor this water temperature because based on previous laboratory studies, we were able to determine this critical temperature at which the glochidia are developing while they're attached to their host fish. 
The winged maple leaf is one of the few species that actually develops and grows while it's attached to the host fish. As you recall, they are attached to their hosts for approximately six months, which is a fairly long period of time. The glochidia go on to the host fish at about 60 microns in size. And generally speaking, they drop off their host fish when they reach about 250 to 300 microns in size. So it's important for us to keep track of this temperature and then based on the required temperature degree days for development, we need to make sure that we get those host fish out of the ponds and move them into our culture facility indoors, place them into tanks where we are able to recover the newly released juveniles. In the bottom here, you can see an example of a data recording device, the mini dot data loggers. Um, in the middle, we're showing us downloading some of that data which we do periodically during the time that their fish are in the ponds. And then the bottom right is an example of those glochidia while they're attached to the fish gills. You can see the little white dots between the lamellae of uh, the gill filaments. And <clears throat> as you can see, there's a large number of uh, glochidia attached to these host fish. In spring of 2021, the Hatchery River Channel catfish that we inoculated the previous September produced approximately 6,000 juvenile winged maple leaf. And we supplied about 2,000 of those juveniles to the Genoa National Fish Hatchery, and they placed them into uh, sediment grow out boxes, something that's similar to shown here on the bottom right. That um, those containers are held at room temperature, they're aerated, they contain well water a small amount of fine sediments, and then they're supplied with a commercial algal diet. Uh, then, then periodically uh, additional food is added to them, water changes are done, and then they are um, assessed for juvenile survival and growth. Um, the Genoa National Fish Hatchery did find that um, some of the juvenile mussels did quite well in these systems, and they grew from about 0.3 millimeters to about 0.5 millimeters. Um, over uh, the summer period of time. Uh, in addition, some of the juveniles that we held at our facility at UMass were held under various conditions or various scenarios. And that included trying to hold them in these um, systems that are called suspended upwelling systems or subseas. We placed them in our outdoor mesocosm tanks. And that's a photo shown here at the bottom left. Those little yellow covers are just the top of of those subsea systems. Basically, the way they're set up is they have fine mesh in them. The juveniles are placed in this cup system, and the water is drawn up through the bottom, out through the top using a, an aeration system. The idea is to try to keep and maintain flow to supply um, these juveniles with um, a continual food source and oxygenated water. In this case, they're placed in pond water. The other way that we held um, some of our juveniles at the UMass facility was in these two middle panels shown here. Again, those were outdoor intermesocosm tanks. We placed uh, some of the fish before they dropped the juveniles off into these large mesocosm tanks, which contained a sand substrate. Uh, and then we placed a egg crate uh, material over the top of that to prevent the fish from getting into and digging around in the substrate to resuspend it. So once the juveniles dropped off those fish, we then took the channel catfish out and main and removed the egg crate and then um, maintained that um, mesocosm tanks with pond water flowing in continuously throughout the summer at natural outdoor temperatures. Um, and then um, at the end in the fall, uh, late October, we then sifted through all of that sand to recover any of the juveniles that may have survived. And what you see here in this uh, picture at the far right is an example of one of the juveniles that we recovered from those mesocosm tanks. Unfortunately, um, we only recovered 11 juveniles. They were about a millimeter in total length, um, but unfortunately, all of those were dead. So they did grow from about 0.3 microns, or excuse me, 0.3 millimeters to one millimeter. So there's definitely evidence to suggest that the juveniles could survive and grow utilizing this technique. 
A small subsample of the juveniles that were produced in the spring of 2021 were also placed in a bioassay trailer that was positioned along the St. Croix River. And here you see some of the photos from that effort. Uh, we're fortunate to work with our National Park Service partners who introduced us to the Wild Rivers Conservancy and be able to make uh, this opportunity available to us for holding the juvenile mussels within the bioassay trailer that would be then supplied with fresh river water and sediment, uh, along with associated nutrients that the juveniles might need to survive. So the great thing about this partnership is that we were able to work out some of the difficulties of keeping this trailer running over this period of time. The juveniles were placed in the trailer in June. Uh, we did make periodic assessments um, over time to see if the juveniles were surviving. Unfortunately, we determined in early August that they had all died. However, we were able to develop this great partnership and we definitely knew that we needed to try uh, attempt again to keep these juveniles in the bioassay trailer as a potential um, juvenile culture method. So in the fall of 2021, we began the wing maple leaf propagation efforts over again. Uh, where the muscle coordination team uh, went out and collected gravid female wing maple leaf. They were brought to our center where we inoculated about 200 hatchery rear channel catfish. Uh, the difference this year was that we utilized both large channel catfish from the blind pony fish hatchery, as well as smaller size eight to 10 inch channel catfish that we had at our center. Um, those fish were inoculated with three uh, gravid female wing maple leaf and then placed into separate ponds uh, to uh, carefully monitor their temperature over winter in hopes of producing viable juveniles in the spring. In the spring of 2022, the hatchery root channel catfish that we inoculated the previous September produced approximately 58,000 juvenile wing maple leaf. In the photo at the upper right, you see some of the larger channel catfish that we would bring in from the ponds and it overwintered. Again, we do this so that we were able to collect the juveniles before they drop off these fish. They're placed in these larger tanks in our fish culture facility in well water, and then the uh, water flows through this standpipe. The juveniles drop off at the bottom of the tank, the water flows out the standpipe, it flows into a catchment basin, and we have a filter system that then collects and recovers those juvenile wing maple leaf. About 13,500 of those juveniles were sent to the uh, Genoa National Fish Hatchery, and they placed them into these sediment grow out boxes, similar to what they did the previous year, because this is something that actually seemed to show some uh, promise for the uh, survival of the juveniles, at least uh, in the short term. In the bottom left, you see an example of one of those sediment boxes. Those are held um, at room temperature in a static type system, so uh, not flowing. They contained well water, some fine silt organic sediment, and they were supplied with uh, a commercial algal diet and aerated. And then periodically that water would um, be refreshed and the juveniles would be assessed for survival and growth. The middle two photos here are um, examples of how the Minnesota DNR uh, in Lake City, their um, folks held the juveniles that we supplied to them, approximately uh, 8,000 juveniles, in placing those into two different systems, the first being a five-gallon bucket which is again a static system, somewhat similar to the sediment grow up boxes, but in this case contains a larger uh, volume of water. In this case, it was also the Mississippi River water, and they uh, placed a uh, small amount of fine organic rich sediment that they uh, use really for all of their uh, mussels, the different species at their culture facility. In addition to that, they aerated it and they supplied, again, a, a commercial algal diet um, to these buckets. They also had um, these bio bullets that they put in there, and those are to help reduce any ammonia waste products. And ammonia has been shown to be, um, mussels are very sensitive to an ionized ammonia. So uh, this is a way by which we can try to reduce any waste products, which may be detrimental to the juveniles. 
The photo next to that shows their sprinkler system, which is a flow through system. It also was supplied with Mississippi River water. It was aerated and they had the same fine organic rich sediment in there and they supplied them with the same commercial algal diet as well. Um, and then uh, periodically these systems would be cleaned out and the juveniles would be assessed for their survival and growth and then placed back into these same systems. At UMass, we um, held the juveniles under a couple of different conditions. One, again, going back to um, the potential of placing some of the fish before they drop the juveniles off into our outdoor mesocosm tanks that contained uh, fine sand sub substrate um, and then supplied with pond water continuously flowing. The fish were placed in there, the juveniles would drop off, the fish would be removed, and we maintained those tanks, was supplied with pond water at outdoor regular natural temperatures um, throughout the summer. And in the um, late fall, the sediment would be removed from those mesocosm tanks, sifted through it to recover any surviving juveniles. In addition, we also held some of the juveniles in these sediment boxes, similar to the Genoa National Fish Hatchery approach. Um, really, after the juveniles were, were recovered from the, the fish in these tanks, um, in our culture facility, we then immediately placed them into these sediment boxes, supplied with river water, excuse me, uh, well water. They were aerated and they were supplied with a, a commercial algal diet. Uh, the difference here between those being held at Genoa versus at our facility is we place them into uh, a water bath that tried to maintain the water temperature at about 20 degrees um, Celsius, so a little warmer than those that are being held at Genoa. A larger subsample of the juvenile wing maple leaf were placed into the bioassay trailer in 2022 partnering once again with the National Park Service and the Wild Rivers Conservancy, we were fortunate to be able to place this trailer at the same location along the St. Croix River as in 2021. Over a three week period beginning in early June, we added approximately 3,600 juvenile wing maple leaf to the trailer within containers that were placed in some larger tanks. The setup was the same that we had in the bioassay trailer the previous year. The river water would come into the bioassay trailer and flow through uh, a head box, then through gravity flow to these larger tanks below, which contained the smaller containers where the juvenile mussels were placed. Um, we did make some modifications to the bioassay trailer from the previous year, and that included moving the T-bar, uh, which, which supplied the the water over the juveniles, having that water flow first up against the tank as opposed to flowing directly into those containers, hopefully trying to prevent any washout of juvenile mussels um, through too much flow. In addition, we added a baffle system to the head box tank. And the reason we did this is to try to prevent um, a great deal of the fine sediments that is supplied from the river um, to get into the system below and potentially um, suffocate the juvenile mussels. So that baffling system, which was placed in the head box, really did a great job at settling out some of those fine materials. Um, over this period of time, from June to the end of September, the Wild Rivers Conservancy and the National Park Service folks did an amazing job making sure every day that this bioacid trailer was functioning properly, that the water was coming in, taking daily water temperature and dissolved oxygen readings for us, recording that information, uh, as well as other general maintenance stuff, just to make sure that the trailer was functioning properly. Uh, we also had uh, continuous monitoring being done of the water temperature and the dissolved oxygen from the water in the tank, in the bioassay trailer using a mini data logger. We also deployed one of those data loggers at the river uh, hanging from a dock so that we could ensure that the water temperature and dissolved oxygen from the river was represented in the bioassay trailer as well. Then weekly, we made assessments of the juvenile muscle growth and survival during the time that they were deployed in the trailer, as I said, from June to uh, the middle of September. 
The photo at the bottom here is a petri dish and it shows three of the juvenile wing main bleed. This photo was taken probably about the first week in September. And so we were super excited to see the juveniles growing as large as they were. Um, this time last year, the year previous, I should say, um, we did not have any surviving wing maple leaf. Now for some exciting results from our 2022 propagation efforts with the wing maple leaf. The Minnesota DNR partners were able to keep 244 uh, juvenile wing maple leaf alive while they were held under the static five gallon bucket conditions in their propagation facility. These muscles grew from 0.3 millimeters to an average of 1.4 millimeters total length. Uh, here you can see a photo on the top is uh, an image of those juvenile muscles. Um, you can see there's various size ranges of the juveniles. The point being is that they're still alive. And this photo was taken uh, at the end of October of 2022. I just received word last week from Lindsay Loam that 51 of those juvenile muscles are still alive and have now grown to just under three millimeters in total length. Um, so this is really exciting news. And, and certainly um, this propagation method and holding technique of placing these juvenile muscles uh, in a static situation with river water and some amount of river sediment is definitely showing some promise in terms of, of keeping these juveniles alive. In addition, from the bioassay trailer, we were able to recover 102 juvenile muscles um, that survived and grew from 0.3 millimeters to four millimeters in total length uh, by the end of September last year. Now, that's a much better growth rate uh, compared to uh, those that were seen in the, the Minnesota culture uh, facility. And this is not terribly surprising because under the bioassay conditions, these muscles are being held in their native river water and sediment. So in um, three months period of time, these muscles were able to grow uh, from 0.3 to 4 millimeters in total length. And this is um, a pretty uh, amazing growth rate. And we're really excited about that. These muscles were then placed into a tote. And at the uh, uh, recommendation of the Fish and Wildlife Service, the muscles are now currently being overwintered in the St. Croix River and are the first muscles uh, that have been juvenile muscles that have been propagated from the St. Croix River strain um, since 2005. Under objective three in the fall of 2021, we coordinated the capture of channel catfish from the St. Croix River to coincide with this very brief window of the wing maple leaf brooding activity, which begins typically at the end of August through the end of September. We captured a total of 34 channel catfish using baited hoop nets. And then based on size, 13 of those channel catfish were implanted with uh, surgically implanted with low-tech transmitters. And here you can see a photo of us implanting one of those larger channel catfish with the transmitter. Um, then on September the 16th, with the assistance of our partners from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, the University of Minnesota, and the Wild Rivers Conservancy, those 13 fish were inoculated with the glochidia from two gravid female wing maple leaves. Those fish were then free released back into the St. Croix River, and we are currently passively tracking their movements with, within the river from St. Croix Falls Hydroelectric Dam to the confluence with the Mississippi River at Prescott using these submersed low-tech data logger receivers. Two of those receivers were also positioned within the Mississippi River, both upstream and downstream of the St. Croix River. This was the first attempt to try to capture wild channel catfish, surgically implant them with transmitters, artificially inoculate them with the St. Croix River strain of the wing maple leaf, and then free release them back into the riverway to track their movement and identify potential juvenile release survey locations for future monitoring efforts. Here are some preliminary results from that channel catfish taking effort. Uh, initially, all 13 of the channel catfish that we tagged, inoculated, and, re and released in the St. Croix moved downstream. This is uh, pretty common for the fish to move downstream once they're placed back into the river. 
Um, two of those tagged fish then moved back upstream and were captured on low tech receivers near the Wisconsin Interstate Park area. One of those fish then moved back downstream and overwintered near Brock Island, while another moved downstream and overwintered near Hudson. And both the Rock Island and the Hudson areas, uh, based on previous channel catfish movement studies that we've done in the St. Croix, uh, have shown that the Rock Island and the Hudson area are common overwintering locations for the channel catfish. Eight of the 13 channel catfish that we released back into the river were last recorded in September of 2021. Now, this isn't particularly unusual given that the channel catfish are pretty notorious for um, expelling their internal transmitters. Uh, this is something that makes this species particularly diff difficult to work with when you're doing uh, movement studies. Uh, those fish were uh, either last reported on our data loggers near the Peasley Lake area, the log house landing area, or once again, the Hudson area. As for uh, some of the fish that had maintained their transmitters, one of those channel catfish had overwintered in the Hudson area. That fish then moved back upstream in the spring of 2022 and was found near, uh, recorded near the mussel bed uh, during the time at which the juvenile mussels would have been dropping off based on that temperature degree day for development. That fish then moved back down into the Hudson area where it is overwintering this year. Um, so we were really excited to see this movement. Uh, it demonstrates that there is the potential that the um, channel catfish that we inoculated with the wing maple leaf may have uh, been able to provide uh, propagated juveniles back into the natural bed. One of the channel catfish uh, that overwintered near the Prescott area uh, actually went upstream into the Mississippi River uh, last spring during the time at which the juveniles would have been dropping off. And this is the first time that we've been able to demonstrate that fish from the St. Croix River that in this case we knowingly have uh, inoculated with wing maple leaf glochidia was um, actually recorded as moving into the Mississippi River during the time at which the juveniles are dropping off. So there's the potential for um, the juveniles to hopefully survive in the Mississippi River and potentially um, working towards that effort of trying to uh, increase the wing maple leaf population um, and, and repopulate it back into its uh, more historic distribution. So we're really excited about that. It'll be several years before we will be able to determine whether this is actually something that's uh, successfully occurring. That fish that was present um, in the Mississippi River during the time at which the juvenile wing maple leaf would have been dropping off, then later moved back up into the St. Croix River and is currently overwintering in the Hudson area. Uh, the pictures that you see here over on the right are just images of um, the low tech receivers that we deploy um, placed in various locations um, in the St. Croix River. The bottom picture you here, you can see this um, sample was actually taken or this receiver photo was taken um, this last fall uh, near in the Mississippi River. And you can see that um, the sled that we use to maintain the position of the receiver is actually totally coated in zebra mussels. Um, when we checked this sampler, it would have been in probably spring uh, of 2022. That uh, sled did not have any zebra mussels on it. So that was a pretty good bumper crop of zebra mussels that uh, settled on that, um, <clears throat> that sled. Just as a reference, uh, zebra mussels are definitely an issue, which of course we all know. Future research for wing maple leaf propagation in 2023 includes demonstrating a continued ability to hold the host fish over winter within our ponds at our research facility in UMass. We currently are holding 25 large channel catfish that were infested with Glochidia from one gravid female. Uh, this number of infested fish is a very low number. However, we're still optimistic that we'll be able to produce a large number of viable um, juveniles to work with. 
Um, although the muscle coordination team spent numerous hours searching for a gravid female wing maple leaf in the St. Croix, uh, it's likely due to these fluctuating water temperatures and our ability to be there at the time at which these wing maple leaf are displaying for us to be able to, to capture um, those to include in our propagation efforts. Um, we will continue to work with our partners to refine the propagation holding techniques for the juveniles once we produce them um, to try to optimize their survival and growth. We will, in addition, conduct a comprehensive analysis of the St. Croix sediment. Um, this appears to be uh, an important component of the longer term survival of those juvenile wing maple leaf, at least based on what we saw in 2022. Uh, we will also try to better characterize the um, St. Croix River water chemistry as well as the algal community to try to help provide some additional um, cues as to the important factors that are supporting the survival and the growth of the juvenile wing maple leaf. In addition, we will identify um, using uh, help and assistance with our partners, hopefully some zebra mussel free locations uh, within the St. Croix River that we can use to grow out these propagated juveniles long term, as well as suitable overwinter locations. And with that, I would like to take this opportunity to once again thank all of our numerous. All right, thank you, Michelle, for this great presentation. So for those of you that are on with us, we have time for questions. And it's not every day we get an amazing scientist like Michelle here that we can ask about her amazing, uh, just groundbreaking research with these winged maple leaf mussels. So please, if you have any questions, type them in the chat box and we will get Michelle to answer your questions. I hope everybody stayed awake. <laughs> a Absolutely. Lot of, there's a lot of information there. So I see one of the questions was, how do we surgically implant uh, the transmitters? Um, in this case, we're actually planting the transmitters into uh, the channel catfish, which is the host fish. Um, so we anesthetize the fish uh, with a uh, electroshocking system. And once the fish is immobilized, then um, we basically cut open the skin in the abdomen, implant the transmitter, and then um, surgically slow it back, sew them back up, uh, let them recover a bit in some water, and then release them into the river. And I don't know if anybody can see this, but here's an example of one of those transmitters that we placed into uh, the channel catfish. As you can see, these transmitters are quite large. Um, they last in terms of the duration of uh, being able to passively track the channel catfish for uh, just a little over a year. Um, and, and basically what happens is this is implanted into the abdomen of the fish. Once we release it into the river, um, those uh, low-tech receivers that I showed in one of the last photos are, are placed in different locations. And as the fish moves by with this transmitter in it, it sends out a signal which is then captured on that receiver. And it identifies each one of these transmitters has a unique identification number. That way we are able to know um, the location of those fish. And it doesn't give us um, specific point locations because if the fish are continually moving, it's just this passive movement to know whether they're going upstream or downstream. So I hope that helps. Um, okay, so one of the questions was, um, they wanted to know whether or not we could provide some information on what are some of the main possible reasons for the juvenile muscle death uh, in this project. Right, that's a great question. Um, it, it is difficult. I mean, these are a species, they produce lots and lots and lots of, of juvenile muscles are produced. And then we know that the majority of them are probably not going to survive. Um, if certainly if all the juveniles that were produced by the muscle survived, then they probably wouldn't be considered endangered. 
Um, so we would expect a lot of mortality just due to this, the fact that so many of them are actually are produced. Um, it, it's important for the juvenile mussels to be able to get uh, the food and the resources that they need at these critical development periods of time. When they are dropping off of their host fish, it's likely that the juvenile mussels have some limited amount of reserves coming from their host fish. And so when we provide them with substrate, in this case, organic rich sediment um, and um, an environment that we're holding them in that hopefully has uh, few predators, so predatory worms that potentially could be eating them. We're trying to minimize that and control those conditions. Uh, we're hopeful that they're gonna be able to make those transitions from that uh, resources that they have after they drop off the fish to the external food resources. It's believed that probably some of the mussels at that stage, early stage, are pedal feeding, where they're using their food, their foot, which is highly ciliated, and they're moving that across the sediment surfaces and bringing in any food sources, bacteria, fungi, or uh, materials that may be important for their growth and development um, into their uh, body, and then sorting that and using what they need, and then they excrete the waste product. So what we're hoping is that we're providing them the conditions that they need to be able to make it through those different transition periods. I think that one of the reasons why the BioIC trailer was really successful in producing some of these first juveniles that we were able to keep alive longer term was because they were placed in their native sediment and native of water. So they really would have the conditions that they need, the microfauna associated with the sediment and the water chemistry that's necessary for those juvenile mussels to survive and grow. Um, it's certainly worth noting that the Minnesota DNR uh, facility has been able to keep some of those juvenile mussels alive using um, their culture setup. Um, I think this is one of the first times that that's been able to been shown as being successful. So we're really hopeful that we're able to demonstrate some, some ways to be able to keep them alive long-term. And, and once we get that kind of recipe figured out, hopefully we'll be able to do a a better job doing that multiple years in a row, as opposed to just very spare, you know, sporadically. Okay. So is, it is yep. now 1247. I think we probably have time for one more question. Okay. Um, the next question I see here is, uh, will warming the water temperatures hinder reproduction, not just the winged maple leaf population, but with all freshwater mussel populations. So I, I'm assuming what we're talking about here is this idea of um, global warming and will this cause um, potential problems for uh, the mussels, not in this case, the, the winged maple leaf, but other mussel species as well. Um, I, I definitely think that, you know, warmer temperatures could potentially cause problems. Uh, there is this really this need for the fish and muscle interaction and um, the, the connection for the, the period of timing when which the muscles are actively moving up out of the substrate of the bottom of the river, becoming at the surface, the sediment water interface and reproductively active to have that connection with the host fish is, is really all based on temperature, the timing of the temperature. So those are some of the cues that they use to make those reproductive efforts start happening. So if the temperatures get warmer, this potentially could cause a, a desynchronization uh, between the fish and the muscle itself. So um, certainly warmer temperatures potentially could cause problems with oxygenation, it could changes in the algal community, which potentially could uh, disrupt their food supply. So there's a, a lot of reasons why um, getting temperatures that are out of the normal range for species can cause them to, to die. Well, great. Thank you so much, Michelle, for answering those uh, very important questions. Um, you'll see in the chat box that there will be some links there for you to complete a Google survey form about today's presentation and some information on how you can register for the next Lunch and Learn that we have coming up. Um, to learn more about Wild Rivers Conservancy and view our upcoming events, including our next Lunch and Learn, Lake Sturgeon of the St. Croix and Namakagan Rivers, please visit us at our website, wildriversconservancy.org. Uh, be sure to not miss another event by signing up for our e-news on our homepage. We thank you for attending and a special thank you to Michelle for this very important work that you're doing with valuable partners here in the Riverway. We hope everyone has a wonderful day.